are listening to Tailspin. I'm Melanie. One of the people I've had an opportunity to collaborate with is Lisa Calamaro. Lisa teaches storytelling privately and at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Like me, Lisa knows that storytelling will save the world. I hosted a storytelling event where some of her students came to share the stories they had developed while they were in her class. First, you'll hear from Lisa herself, and then one of her students, Ryan Hill. Uh, Well, I am a film and television agent, and I'm also a teacher of storytellers. I guess I've been around story for most of my career. Started out working with novelists and then moved into filmmakers, and now I'm also working with anyone that wants to find their voice and tell their story, whether it's a student at the university or whether it's a private private client who is looking to find their voice and then figure out what their story is and how to tell it. My career started in the publishing business, so I began working with novelists and then eventually moved into the film the film part of it, which is where I wanted to be, but I didn't know quite how to get there. But I So I worked at a literary agency in New York, and they had a film department, but <laughs> in those days, nobody really, none of those agents really wanted to deal with the film people, and I thought they were very exotic and, and, and glamorous, so whenever any film people would come to the office looking for material, looking for IPs, basically. Now we now we call them IPs, but looking What's for IP? intellectual property. Oh, very but, fancy. But when people were coming looking for books, whether it was nonfiction or fiction, to turn into films, all the other agents would run for the hills because they just thought they were dreadful. But I loved the Hollywood people, so I would take all the meetings, and eventually that led to me handling screenwriters and then directors and occasionally a producer. Any Whether a story is, is a, a fiction piece or nonfiction piece, it's the same. It's a story about transformation. It's a story about a journey. It's a story about someone's change. And so the, the way that happens is just the difference. But the, but the qualities underneath it are the same. The structure ultimately is the same. And we know now from functional MRIs that when we tell a story, our brain changes. Regardless whether it's um, like autobiographical? Right, or? it doesn't matter. As long as it's told in a very specific way, our brains change. What's, what way is that? Like, like in the a, descriptive stuff? Or? Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a structure to it. And so as long as you tell a story in that structure, then our, our brains begin to communicate with each other, the, the listener and the, and, the, and the storyteller begin to connect. But our brains change. Like So if you tell someone a list of things, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you tell someone a list of things, two places in their brain light up. When you tell a story in the right format, seven places in the brain light up. Wow. Yeah. So we know scientifically now that story is, is actually hardwired into us. And so for me, this is was proof of what I knew instinctually as someone who grew up loving stories. And got into the business of helping people tell stories. So what got you here? To, to, teaching, to, teaching, to teaching people to find their voice. Right. Well, uh, you know, truthfully, a, a number of factors came along. Part of that was that I had been mentoring people in screenwriting for a long time as an agent and as um, someone who works for some nonprofit organizations working with screenwriters. And that led to some opportunities at the university level. And I decided, oh, I'll just try that and see what it is. And out of that, I created this class, Finding Your Voice, Telling Your Story, which has been really one of the greatest gifts of my life, being able to walk people through that process of how they connect the pieces of their lives and make sense of it and make sense of their, their own story and then put voice to that. Well, this is what I've learned about working with storytellers, it just finding myself in this position, is that I ask my friends first. I ask my friends, oh, come here and tell me something. And they, you know, there's always this discussion. I don't have any stories. Right. And then you have to say, oh, that's BS. I get drunk with you all the time. Right. <laughs> I've heard your stories, blah, blah, blah. Right. And then they come here to do me a favor and keep, you know, and get involved in this project. And then when they... When they leave, I guess it's, you know, our brains lighting up. You know, when they tell their story, they'll say, oh, that was easier than I thought, or that was fun, or when are you going to do that again? Right. And then I always, I get this reward of um, 
It's just really interesting. I know it sounds cheesy to say I feel honored that people share their stories with me, but I do. But that, but that is really what will heal the world. I really believe that more than ever. I feel driven to help people tell their stories in whatever form it is, whether it's screenwriting, whether it's uh, through personal storytelling. I don't care how we tell your story, just but tell a story. And 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 I think that that's one of the things. It's is when. People say, oh, that was easy, or that was... They're just so happy to be heard. All right, hi, uh, my name's Ryan, and I am a huge homosexual. (laughs) (laughs) I know you're shocked. (laughs) Uh, No, it sounds like a weird way to start it, like this is some sort of AA support group for, like, like, hi, I'm gay. Um, but it's so that I can tell you the story about how I came out twice. Um, the first time I came out was actually sort of a laughably uneventful situation. When I told my friends that I was gay, they all just breathed a sigh of relief, like, oh, thank God you finally figured it out. <laughs> and my dad said he had known since I was three years old when, with no training whatsoever, I executed the most perfect cartwheel he had ever seen. <laughs> The only, (laughs) yeah, I I will, I will for sure. I will show you. It is actually spectacular, to an almost alarming degree. Um, And uh, so the only person who apparently didn't know I was gay before me was my mom. Um, And so I was like, "Yay, I get to surprise somebody." Um, Awesome. But it was also kind of scary because she was the one person who. It would upset me if I were to disappoint her. So, uh, and actually, I didn't even get to tell her. She beat me to the punch, and one day she asked me, are you gay? And what felt like 10,000 seconds passed in bone-chilling silence. It was probably only like three seconds, but you couldn't tell my clenched butt cheeks. It was anything less than like a decade. I couldn't make a diamond in there. And... um, (laughs) And so I eventually whispered, um, you know, quietly, yes. And she didn't scream at me, and she didn't go crazy. All I could, like, she didn't give me any of the histrionics I was sort of, like, fearing were going to happen. She crossed her arms and looked, I guess what I could only call as, like, mildly perturbed, (laughs) and said to me, your insurance is going to go up. (laughs) And, (laughs) and And she walked out of the room. And I was, I was like, not old. I didn't think, so I was like, are gay people bad drivers? Like, I don't understand. Like, maybe some of you don't know that, like, before there was the Affordable Care Act, being uh, gay could be considered a pre-existing condition, sort of like being a smoker, except you smoked something different than cigarettes. Was that one too dirty? That's where I crossed the line? So anyways, um... After I told my, my, my mom finally came around and everybody, you know, and my life was great. No one be, was beating the Bible at me. No one was disowning me. And I had this newfound sense of identity. And so it was actually towards the end of high school and I was graduating and I was going to start my career in entertainment. And I was going to be, you know, an actor. Um, and so I got an agent and I started working commercials and I had like a career trajectory. Like it looked like I was actually going to do stuff. And so my agent suggested I meet with this really high-powered uh, Hollywood acting coach. And she was everything that you would imagine from a Hollywood acting coach. You know, she was acerbic and bitter, and everyone talked about how she was like this straight, she's a straight shooter, she'll give it to you straight. She's, she's so truthful, which just means she's a mean bitch. That's all that, all that means is she's a mean old bitch. And... Um, <laughs> similar and so um i met with her and the first thing she said to me was you're too gay you look like a lead but you act like a gay best friend and suddenly this identity that i was so proud of shattered into pieces around me and i kind of wish that i could tell you this is a story about how i stood up to her and i i did what what i believe to be true but instead it's the story of how i took every bit of advice that she told me. I took vocal lessons to deepen my voice so that I could sound less gay. 
I worked on my mannerisms so I could act less gay. I even started lying to friends and, and colleagues, saying that I wasn't gay, and going so far as to hit on women, which I'm sure was as painful for them as it was for me. <laughs> How you doing? No. So, and, I started, and I started getting to the point where I, I uh, just started to hate the person that I was becoming, and over time, I got sick of being this this phony person like how how is it that i'm gonna get what i want by but i have to be somebody else to do it so eventually i stopped lying uh, i stopped changing my mannerisms i stopped changing my voice and i just stopped and i and i got i got really depressed i i thought i couldn't there was no way i can do this this woman who i decided was the word of god had said i can't have a career and so i can't and I was wallowing in self-pity on the couch uh, when I came across a DVD of uh, one of my favorite comedians, Margaret Cho. And uh, she has been told in her career that she was too fat and too Asian to ever be, how are you too Asian? How do you do that? How is, there, is there a level of Asian? Still confuses me. But that she couldn't be successful. And she essentially said, fuck that. And so I decided to say, fuck that. And I slowly began to pick up the pieces of this identity that I had let fall by the wayside. And, um, and that's when I came out a second time. Uh, but not for everybody else, for myself. It's when I decided that who I was was enough. And not only was it enough, but that it was a pretty brilliant person. And from there, I got asked to do a national comedy tour. I got featured in a movie as an up-and-coming stand-up comic, openly gay stand-up comic, and did a whole bunch of television work, you know, as a big, faggy guy. Like, I just embrace <laughs> this, like, homo guy. And, and he has worked out for me. And uh, <laughs> it's all good. And it's just when I learned, like, the, the most important lesson. And it's, there's only one thing in this world that you can unequivocally say that you do better than anybody else. And that's be yourself. Thank you. I had been dating my boyfriend, Mike, for about five months. I had a plan to go back to my hometown to visit my family. And it seemed like the time that he would be coming back with me to meet them for the first time. And Mike, was a sweet, fun, gregarious guy. I describe him as like a younger, hotter Santa Claus <laughs> who changed his clothes more often, but he really had this jolly vibe about him. We're heading into Buffalo, and during the final descent, I decide this might be a good time for me to tell him a little bit more about my parents. I start with my mom and I say, she's a really kind woman, but she does have a mental illness. She has schizophrenia. She does take medications. I'm sure nothing will happen, but I just want you to know. By the way, my dad, he, um, he's a really fun and interesting guy. He's a big talker. He can talk about any topic in the world. Religion, sports, he'll talk about anything. A beer can. He doesn't care. He's an alcoholic. And when he drinks, he's prone to rants. Nothing I could have said could have prepared us for what was about to happen. We elect to stay with my sister, and we have this plan. We're taking a road trip to go see the Lion King. We're all excited. Mike and I jump in the car. We're going to pick up breakfast before this big road trip. You know, coffee bagels. We are traveling down the absolute busiest street in my hometown, which is Niagara Falls Boulevard. We're at a stoplight. Out of the corner of my eye, I see someone in a bear costume waving at traffic going by. I say to Mike, that's my mom. <laughs> He said, are you sure? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> he 
said, wow. I said, you want to meet her now? <laughs> Pull in the parking lot where she is. And I am filled with embarrassment. All of my childhood memories of how I kept people at arm's length away. I didn't let friends in our house because my mom there was clearly unpredictable. You know, she would hear voices. Sometimes she would say things like, I can't go out today. The voices told me I can't. And I didn't want to subject myself or my family to any sort of ridicule or gossip in town. I'm also a little resentful because I'm thinking I'm going to have to step into this caretaker role again. Like I have to make sure, is mom taking her meds? Does this mean I have to get her to the hospital? I don't know. I don't know what we're going to face here. But Mike is a good sport. He ends up taking a picture with my mom. <laughs> we realize that she doesn't need to be hospitalized, that, you know, in her mentally ill kind of logic, she was telling us a story about how she had read a children's book about someone, a bear, giving bear hugs, and she had planned to give my nephew a bear. She took it really literally. <laughs> and in the meantime, since she had the bear costume, she decided she was going to make people smile all over town. We put Mama Bear in the car, and I drop her home. The next day, we meet my dad. My dad lives in a trailer in a mobile home park. And while there's not junk, you know, in front of the trailer, let's be real, it's still a trailer. We walk in, and conveniently, my dad has a wooden bar in his living room. And hanging above that, bar on the wall is a pair of women's white bikini underwear. I want to do one of these like la 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 la. I just wanted, I, waves of shame are coming over me. I want to hide. We sit down and we talk about this elephant underwear in the room. And my dad decides to regale us with all these women that he's been dating and having all these conquests. As a daughter, you know, with feminist leanings, I'm mortified. We uh, make a quick exit. Mike and I go to Arby's to do beer. Uh, we start with my mother, and I ask Mike, and I say, what would you do, you know, if I had a mental illness like schizophrenia? Dead silence. He said, Tracy, I don't know. In that moment, I felt all of the pain and rejection that my mom had been through throughout her life because she deserves love like any one of us does. We start talking about my dad, and while Mike, you know, he's a guy, he's heard talk like this before, he just was like, I'm just so surprised, like, you're his daughter, and he's talking about this. I'm like, I know. I... Yet I, I start to shift a little, and I start thinking about him and how he had stayed with my mother through her mental illness for 10 years before he left us. And I could feel compassion for him that maybe his drinking and maybe this womanizing was a way to keep women and love at an arm's distance so that his heart wouldn't break again. What was once a source of shame for me has become a source of pride for me because my family is a group of powerful survivors. We might be the strongest people you'll ever meet in the face of adversity and craziness. My parents really shaped 
um, what became really important to me that I carry forward. Like I try to be you know, as compassionate and empathic with anyone I meet because who knows what you know, they've been through or what they're currently going through. And they really informed me about my ideas about love. I aim to love people, not in spite of their differences, but absolutely because of their differences. Speaking of love, Mike and I lasted about six more months. <laughs> we broke up because ultimately I couldn't shake off that Arby's conversation. And I needed to feel like I could trust someone would love me, love me like no matter what. And that's what I wanted to invite into my world. And I must add that to this day, I have a soft spot for bears. <laughs> That was Tracy Sutton with Mama Bear. This episode of Tailspin are all students from Lisa Calamaro's storytelling class, Finding Your Voice, Telling Your Story. I recorded them all live at an event I hosted last fall. Next is Rachel Hilberg with the Eagle Eye Detective Agency. So it's the first day of seventh grade, and the hallway smells like cheap textbook glue sweat socks and fear <laughs> and I realize almost immediately that it's my fear because things are a little different this year suddenly girls are interested in hair and makeup and boys and I'm just worried about what's going to happen to the Eagle Eye Detective Agency <laughs> so when I was in first grade I read my first choose your own adventure story and I was immediately hooked on a good mystery by second grade, I was reading Nancy Drew, and I decided I wanted to be Nancy Drew more than anything. And in third grade, my best friend since kindergarten and I both started reading the Babysitter's Club books, the mysteries and super mysteries, and we decided we were going to form our own club. It was going to be a club of girl detectives, and we were going to call ourselves the Eagle Eye Detective Agency. <laughs> So Amy was the kind of girl who, if you were into sports, which I was not, you would want her as your team captain. So naturally, she was our leader. She was our president. And I had most of the knowledge on how to be a kid detective that I had gathered from books. So, of course, I was the vice president. <laughs> we had this friend, Yvette, who had the most gorgeous handwriting I've ever seen. And, of course, we made her our secretary. And she was responsible for recording all of the minutes to our weekly meetings, or our bi-weekly bi meetings, really. We'd always meet at lunchtime at school um, in secret. And we'd meet, and we'd sit on a cinder block wall of this planter. And under the trees, we would talk about how we were going to get our first case, the first big break. Because we're eight. No one's <laughs> dropping cases in our laps. <laughs> So how would we hone our skills with no real cases? We started making up our own cases, and this included just a collection of villains and supervillains that we had concocted as a mashup of the Power Rangers, Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, and Because We Are Being Raised in the Church, the Bible. So our head supervillain, the baddest of the bad, she was Jezebel, and we called her Jezzy. <laughs> <laughs> and the way it worked was anything that went awry, just in life in general, we knew Jesse was behind it. So when Amy's neighbor's dog went missing, we knew somehow, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesse was responsible for this. And where do you go to find a supervillain who looks like Elvira and dresses like Morticia Adams? Certainly the goth kids must know what's up, so... We go to the mall, and if you can just imagine for a second. <laughs> it's the 90s. Um, <laughs> so after school, if you can just imagine for a sec, we're tiptoeing and ducking behind ornamental shrubberies and crab walking along the wall outside of the Hot Topic. <laughs> it was us. <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't find her that day, but we gathered some pretty good leads. Um, 
the way our detective club worked is um, we'd only really meet during the school year because even though we were really good friends, we wouldn't see each other that much over the summer. So that was fine because every school year we'd pick back up where we left off. Like no time had passed. Detective meetings at lunch at the planner. But the year between sixth and seventh grade, I could feel that the time had passed. Because when I got back, other girls were growing boobs and I had braces. And somehow inexplicably, one of the things that was cool in addition to the hair and the makeup was sticker collecting. So these girls would have these giant three ring binders full of sheet stickers that they would collect and swap like baseball cards. And when I caught up to my best friend, Amy, third period, she was in that group with the hair and the boobs and the stickers. And I found a vet at lunch later, and she wasn't super into talking about detective shenanigans either, and it was kind of a moot point without our president. That was okay, we'll, we'll just take a little bit of a longer break and come back later, adjust to junior high. But as the year wore on, I started to worry that Amy was telling our top secret detective club stuff to her new friends maybe gossiping and but I didn't have any proof and I couldn't imagine that she would betray me like that so one day I'm walking into gym which sucks because I'm a nerd and it's gym class (laughs) and I'm wearing this oversized heather gray t-shirt with our school logo on the front and these giant basketball shorts navy blue that go all the way down to my knees and my little stick legs stick out of them just feeling gross and self-conscious. And as I walk into the gym, I see Amy in her circle of future cheerleaders and their gym outfits even seem to fit them better than mine fits me. And you're talking and laughing and I get a knot in my stomach. And she looks up at me. It's really the first time she's acknowledged my presence this year. And I get really worried, but I get a little bit of hope because she's had time to get used to this group of people and and feel integrated into this group. Maybe this is the moment where she asks if her best friend since kindergarten can be invited to join in their shenanigans. And sure enough, um, she says something to this other girl, Carly, and Carly comes over and I kind of look behind me to make sure that I'm not about to embarrass myself as she's saying hi to somebody else who's walking in behind me and there's no one else there. So She gets about three feet from me, and she smiles at me, and she says, So, how's Jessie? Then I have my evidence. I'm crushed. And I feel alone. I've lost my detective club, lost my best friend. Needless to say, I... I cry myself to sleep that night and many other nights that year and I start I start to spend a good deal of time in the junior high library where I discover this incredible encyclopedia of art and it reminds me that when everyone else left the detective club I was left with what I started out with my imagination And as soon as I let go of the embarrassment I felt it had caused me, I let it lead me. And it led me to meeting other creative weirdos. Artists, mystery lovers, and it led me to an amazing art career, one that I couldn't imagine possible, where I never had to stop being a girl detective because that's what my art is about. I design little secret messages and decoder wheels, and I even got to recently work on a TV show making props and maps, code books, ciphers for this show called The Friendless Five. And it is a show about a squad of teen girl detectives. (laughs) And because I'm a good detective, I also happen to know that Amy, while she was doing everything she had to to be cool, still wanted to be an eagle-eyed detective. Because... 
One day, when she was away from all of her cool friends after school, she saw me sitting on that cinder block planter, and she skipped over to me and smiled at me with a smile that was completely lacking in malice or sarcasm. And she handed me a sticker from her sticker collection. It, uh, it was a smiley face wearing sunglasses, and in big, bold font, it said, Great Detective. I'd like to thank Lisa Calamaro, Ryan Hill, Tracy Sutton, and Rachel Hilbert for their contributions to Tailspin. If you'd like me to record a spoken word event of yours, or if you got a story to tell, hit me up. Look for Tailspin on Facebook, or you can contact me through my website, melaniehiller.com. Without you, there's no story. Look up! Look up! Focus on the beautiful, ever-changing.